Hello, everyone. I'm very excited because we have another special guest, Mr. Jake Cousine, who I'm just going to tell us about himself and his journey to medicine. Yeah. Hi, Erkita. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, so, yes, my name is Jake Cousine, and I'm currently a fifth year MD PhD student, which means I'm training as a physician scientist. And the story I want to tell you begins in high school for me. And it's when my high school biology teacher came to me with a flyer that said mini med school neuro night. And it was an outreach event at the local college of medicine. And she encouraged me to go. Um, I was curious about science, but I didn't really have any academic motivation to do anything about it because neither of my parents went to college and they didn't really push me one way or the other to do any particular path. And this was good because it really gave me the freedom to kind of find my own path. And I'm really forever grateful for their hands-off support because it gave me, you know, freedom to figure out what I wanted most. And, you know, I think I decided to go to that event because I saw in my parents this struggle, these financial restrictions, it was just difficult for them. And I thought maybe, you know, just maybe medicine could be a way where I could unshackle myself a little bit more. And Erkita, I still remember going to this event because my mom drops me off in her minivan. I show up at the check-in, they hand me a white lab coat, and then they tell me to go to this lecture hall. I go to this lecture hall and there's just this sea of students with black and brown faces and white lab coats. And this was like the biggest smile gets on my face because like these are my people. And then this tall professor just towering over a podium begins lecturing on the complex and mysterious human brain. And he's talking about consciousness and cognitive disease. And I'm just in trance, you know? And at the intermission, they invite us to come down and, and I can hold a real human brain and ask questions. And I'm so nervous that the only question I can ask is, you know, the most obvious one, how does it work? And I remember the physician looks at me warmly, and just like, you know, that's for you to figure out. And I think I took that personally. <laughs> you know, I, I remember running out to my mom's minivan, still dressed up in my lab, my lab coat, and just being like, mom, I'm going to be a brain doctor. Like, that's what I want to do. And I didn't know it at the time, but that's really where my journey to MD-PhD began. I think that's an amazing story because it just shows so much about, like, your personal tenacity and like how you were self-motivated and self-driven. Neither one of my parents went to college and I kind of discovered medicine as well. When I was in high school, I was in a mentorship program where we went and we went to shock trauma every like fourth Friday or something like that. And just seeing all of those things in science and medicine and action was just fascinating to me. So for you to share that story, I definitely felt that connection. And I'm sure that a lot of our listeners have as well. But not only that, having that early drive of just like having a very simple question. I know there's a Dr. Seuss quote. I know I'm not quoting it correctly. And it's like, sometimes the questions are simple, but the answers are complicated. And I think oh, most I that in one of my uh, entrance uh, write-ups. So you guys who are looking to figure out how to like Right things don't take techniques from me. <laughs> I use Dr. Seuss, but I think I use that for my my residency applications. But it's so true because you just mm -hmm. ask someone, like, "How's his brain work?" <laughs> like right. the down, down the rabbit hole you go. Absolutely, <laughs> it sent you down this little rabbit hole called uh -huh. the PhD. Yeah. So <laughs> I was about that. Yeah, I mean, it took me a while to get to the MD PhD part. You know, I didn't even know about it. So for me, I was just laser focused on the MD part. I wanted to become a physician, and you know, I was ambitious. I checked all the boxes. I got my EMT's license. I worked as a technician in the emergency room. I got those leadership exper experiences in college. Did the prerequisite coursework. Tried to graduate with honors. You know, I was on top of it, but I also felt emotionally just drained. And I was checking these boxes and not finding that sense of fulfillment that I thought I would find. You know, in the emergency room, I love working with patients, but I just felt like we were often putting band-aids on these deeper problems. And I think I just desired to understand that depth. 
I know the ER is kind of this band-aid station of sorts already, but still, I mean, there are people coming in with untreatable or untreated diabetes, psychiatric crises, uh, you know, neuropathic pain from chemotherapy, and it just seemed like they wasn't being adequately managed and there was a, you know, a deeper problem. And, you know, because I am, I, I was this good pre-med, I was also doing the research experiences, right? Because that makes you a competitive applicant. And I was really so fortunate that my first research experience was with this eccentric and kind neuroscientist. And he studied the sensory nervous system of scorpions of all things. And I was like, yes, I mean, this was my introduction to the world of molecules, to experimentation. And I found deep fulfillment in it because for me, I think, it allowed me to kind of flex this creative muscle that I feel had atrophied in the pre-medical preparation process. I wanted to build, I wanted to create and experimental design. Turns out it was a form of artistic expression for me, one that I didn't even know I had within me. And so I desired then to combine those lab skills with my passion for patient care, but I didn't know how. Uh, I didn't even know about MDPhD, like I mentioned. So, it's, so I, I didn't know anyone who had done it. I didn't know how to do it. And so, you know, I saw opportunities to figure that out. And the one, the place that I really found the answers to my questions was a summer research program. It was for underrepresented students at WashU St. Louis. And that really helped me connect the dots. And the more I learned about MDPhD, the more I realized it was just the best path forward for me. You know, and so to answer your question, I decided to obtain an MDPhD because it was this perspective of duality that it offered. You know, my whole life I've been raised as a Moroccan American and this bicultural identity has always been important to me. And so I grew up with these two distinct cultures and worldviews and I've always found myself living in this gray area. And I know how uh, like powerful perspective that can be for solving these complicated problems. And so when I realized that physician scientist training offered all that free medical school and a compelling career flexibility, I, I was sold, you know? I think if I was like back in my med school days, I'm old. So like <laughs> back in the day, if I, I mean, I think it just sold me on like being in MDPhD, but it was, it was too much school for me. So, mm -hmm. but um, I, I think that you bring up a great point because you were telling me about how you're trying to be an excellent student and trying to check mm -hmm. all the boxes and being in leadership and getting good grades and all of that, but it just, it seemed like there was something else you were looking for, even though you were having these experiences in the emergency room and you were seeing in live action how the healthcare system works or doesn't work. Because like mm -hmm. you said, a lot of it is Band-Aid medicine and we are not necessarily living up to what the United States should live up to with all of the money and things that we do with healthcare, especially with the technology that we have. Right. So you had some doubts and some questions. And I think that's a good point, number one, for students who are now in their pre-med phases who may be looking for other things. I always tell people, if you decide that you wanna go into medicine, that's wonderful. But if there's anything else you wanna do, try that first. And then if you're <laughs> in medicine, do it. And I know that sounds terrible from someone who does like medical student mentorship, mm. but try it first. Yeah, but Keep, your, keep your doors open. Yes. There, there's something more out there sometimes and, and there may be different things you may have wanted to be a DJ like some we had another doctor on who still DJs and is a um, radiologist and then you, you may have wanted to do more things at the bench because a lot of times it's either this or that when you're in medicine you're either on the pre-med track or you're on the track to do research or you're a chemistry major or a pre-med major. And there is no limitation to doing both and then figuring out how you can apply the things you do in the lab to help patients in the future, whether or not that's at the bedside or doing research to help people right. with Alzheimer's and other disorders. So we talked about a lot of the good things and mm -hmm. the self-discovery. Um, I am a firm believer that everyone has obstacles, whether or not it's personal obstacles or academic obstacles, a mix of both or something. Have you encountered any obstacles either while applying to med school or once you were in medical school in your program? Yes, so many obstacles. Um, the one I'm gonna tell you about first, it was really, it was the application process, you know, because for me, there wasn't much of a roadmap to MD, PhD. 
I think I was the only pre-medical student at my college who was applying MD PhD. And although my pre-med committee was supportive, they didn't know how to support me in the MD PhD process. And so for me, I was doing all the due diligence on figuring out like what makes a competitive applicant? How do you put together this application? And I mean, we're talking like six letters of recommendation, those three essays, you know, two days of interviews, learning how to pitch my research, CVs, all of this was a whole new world and I didn't know where to begin. And for me, if it wasn't for mentors and coaching in that summer research program, I think I would have missed the point. You know, I went through so many drafts trying to deliver my story. And honestly, it was like just through these little iterations that I kind of found my voice. And I'm so I'm really grateful that I had the help to kind of overcome those obstacles. Um, many more would occur in medical school, but that's that's those are definitely ones that come to mind. That's awesome. And I think you you bring up a great point because we have a lot of coaches on the show. And a lot of times students may wonder, like, do I really need a coach? Like, I'm not in sports or anything like that. Um, are they just trying to take my money? Or, you know, all of the different questions that you have, like, why can't I do it on my own? And you absolutely can do it on your own. But sometimes mm -hmm. you just need that perspective from someone else who's been through the process or who has seen many students before go through that process to kind of help you kind of streamline what they've seen that has worked. Mm -hmm. Could not agree more. So what advice, since you said there wasn't necessarily a roadmap for you and your advisors didn't really know what happened, what advice did you learn from your coaches and your experiences that you had that you'd like to share with students who may be considering pursuing an MD-PhD? Yeah, so I've got a long list. Um, let's see. The first thing is going to be to start your research early. You want to focus on the fundamentals and finding quality mentorship to do that. Because if you get a good involved mentor, that's going to go such a long way in supporting you throughout this entire process. And you want to seek diverse research experiences. Try to see science from a lot of different angles. Things like the summer research program can put you into a new environment and allow that. Students are often worried about publications. These are good to have, but they're not required. What's important and is required is that you go, you give scientific talks, you go to conferences, you learn how to express yourself scientifically. And you gotta have both the clinical experiences and the research experiences. But if you have to choose one, you wanna prioritize the research early on in your career. Most importantly, I think, is you wanna develop your personal narrative and storytelling. The numbers matter to get your foot in the door, but the storytelling is what gets you a seat at the table. And quality beats quantity every time. You don't need a bunch of research experience. You want to have good experiences that show commitment, passion, and evidence that you know what you're signing up for. And I think the one lesson that I've learned probably most recently through my MD PhD training is that you don't need to be in such a hurry. I was in such a hurry. I wanted to get to the next stage. I wanted to be done with school. I wanted to move on. But this is a lifelong career path. This is what you're choosing to do forever. You're always going to be learning in some capacity or the other. So take your time, enjoy the process. I took a gap year after medical school and it was the best year of my life. I learned so much outside of academia that made me such a better physician, such a better scientist. Live somewhere new, gain new life experiences, you know, take a step back from the pre-med hustle and just realize that the rush that, you know, all the students are, are going through, I assure you it's an illusion. I couldn't have said it better, especially the part about the gap year and rushing. Mm. I personally did not take a gap year. I went straight through. And when I did get to medical school, I saw a lot of my other colleagues who had been engineers or who spent a year traveling or who came from banking, and they just had a diversity of experience and life that they could mm. apply to different things, not only with patient care, that I personally could not do when we were entering those intense years of study. So it's okay to, to take that break. And then also, if you are going straight through from college, you're just going to go from that to the preclinical years, to the clinical years, to residency, which is a whole nother to ball game, <laughs> yeah. to, to yeah. being an attending and just never right. have that break. So that is the time to have the time of your life and to have those experiences if you can. And then also to sit there and reevaluate, like, is this what you want to do? Because mm -hmm. you might think it is, but then you may find another passion out there and that's okay. Right. And so this, this is where I'm going to make another plug for the PhD part, because right now I'm in my PhD 
And now I've got three to four years of protected time to reevaluate. I've been through the clinical stuff. I took step one. I took step two. I know what it looks like. Which way do I want to take my life now? Because it's different from when I was a pre-med. It's different from when I started medical school. Having the PhD time to reevaluate is, is one of the best reasons about it. Absolutely. I love that. Because now you have even more opportunities to decide what you want to do. Do you want to go into biotech or mm -hmm. biopharma? Or do you want to go and do clinical work? So the world is your oyster and you have so many more transferable skills that you can utilize in your future career. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, you have experienced the first two years of medical school. And this is a very popular question as to our pre-meds as to what is it really like? You know how they say you're kind of yeah. like, studying and trying to get all the information from a fire hose. Right. So are there any study tips that you have for the first two years of medical school? I do. And I think these study tips also apply to students preparing for the MCAT. So I think this is really general advice. And there are so many resources you'll find. Don't overload yourself into decision paralysis. You know, the most high value study tip that I can provide you is to focus on a well-designed question bank with a couple of supplemental resources. Right, you know, for the MCAT, don't get the pile of textbooks and the audio books and other people's flashcards. You want to do the question banks with focus and consistency. And I know getting it, questions incorrect stings. I mean, believe me, when I'm taking step one and step two when I'm preparing for it, I'm getting like you know 70% wrong. You got to keep going. You got to learn from those incorrects, and you got to review them religiously. That's the way to improve. So in medical school, it's the same story. Question banks are the best way to ensure that you're not spending your time overly on like the minutiae details, right? You want to find the signal in the noise, I guess. You want to see basically how are these basic science concepts going to be tested in terms of a clinical vignette, right? That's the way that you get asked questions in all the medical school exams. It gives you a clinical scenario. You got to take out the important pieces of information to figure out the best answer to proceed. Um, and then spend your time diving deep on the topics that excite you, right? You don't have to do that on every, every area. Pick the topics that excite you and go deeper. Finally, if lecture isn't working for you to go in person, opt for self-paced study. My lectures were recorded. I did not go to lecture and I would watch and rewatch them at one to two times speed in my own environment. There's no, nothing worse for me to be sitting in a boring lecture where I feel stuck. You know, your time is precious in medical school. So, you know, find a system that works for you and don't feel like you have to copy what everyone else is doing. I love those tips. And I feel as though when I was in that time, I learned it a little late. <laughs> but it, it, they are right. gold. Like, of course, we have our course directors and people who are creating the syllabus. And they're, cre they're teaching you a lot of awesome things that you will need to mostly use as a physician. Mo mostly. <laughs> mostly, <laughs> keyword. Uh, and I've been practicing for 10 years. I can yeah. say that I do not remember the Krebs cycle. Ooh. But <laughs> but I remember what it's called. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a lot of uh, great information that they teach in lecture. But if you spend most of your day in lecture, then you got to go study it afterwards and figure out what they're saying. That time could be maximized by utilizing your resources in the library or at home or a co-working space or wherever it's comfortable for you, where you can listen to their lectures and then take notes and stop and rewind, make your own PowerPoints and those kinds of things. And then also in terms of the question banks that you mentioned, these are tried and true banks that model the questions off of the actual exam that you're going to be taking that kind of goes not only from students from your school but nationwide so these are the things that you need to know that are similar to others so it's, it's definitely good advice to kind of go through those maybe even along with when you're doing your specific section for that course mm -hmm. and then just figuring out like your time isn't necessarily your own when you're in med school but right figuring out that time management. So, okay, if I could take four hours off of lecture and go and listen to it at double speed and take my notes, maybe I can go to the gym. Maybe I can hang out with some friends, go to the movies, go to dinner. So exactly. figuring out that time to get that balance. Yes, exactly. So I love asking my guests about this. And I'm very curious to hear what you say because you've had these experiences um, on the bench and EMT, all of these kinds of things mm. in medical school. Um, what is there one thing that you would change about healthcare? 
if you had a magic wand? Yeah. I mean, I think this is connected to the last question. I think it's the way we prepare physicians and medical students. You know, now it's the case where it's like with information at our fingertips, there's no need, I think, except for tradition to be doing this whole drinking from a fire hydrant approach in medical school. I think as technology becomes more prominent and predictive in a tool in medicine, we need physicians who have more EQ than IQ. And so I would change the medical school student preparation from all this lecture based and learning of minute, minute details and really emphasize the more active patient care experience part. And I do believe there's already a movement towards this. You know, I see it in my, my curriculum at, at my medical school, which is usually you had those two years of basic science and then the clinical years. The way we've done it is we have condensed it down to a year and a half. We integrate that basic science into the physiology, pathophysiology and pharmacology. And then you go into the clinic where you realize that, you know, those minute details don't play a role in improving the patient care experience necessarily. And I feel like I learned more in that one year working with patients about the physiology and pathophysiology than any you know, textbook or, or video had taught me. And so while I do believe the students need a foundation in the basic sciences, I think that foundation is really ingrained through practice. And when students have more practice, they're better with bedside manner, they're better with working with diverse patient populations. They develop a more systematic approach to you know, solving problems in that gray area. And that's where you're going to be practicing most often. So I think we should, we want to train physicians who can problem solve, not demonstrate pattern recognition. And the current system emphasizes skills with pattern recognition. I love that. That concept rings so true. And I think as we move forward and we're utilizing more technology and we are learning different, the world is different. We have telemedicine and all of these different things where you won't necessarily completely be a traditional doctor for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, we need to start thinking outside of the box and training people like it's 2022 or beyond. Yeah. Right, right. So, love that. So you've shared so many words of wisdom, and I'm sure that you're going to inspire a lot of students to consider at least becoming an MD, PhD, physician scientist. Where can our listeners reach out and learn more from you? Yeah, so if students are at all interested in MD, PhD, or just want to hear me talk about more stuff, uh, I am starting to write an MD, PhD blog where I just kind of detail everything that I wish I would have known uh, earlier in my journey in much more detail. Um, you can find the link to that blog and then kind of more like TLDR type information on my Twitter and Instagram. And that's going to be at Jake O. Coos, and I can provide you a, a link to that. Sure. Um, you can reach me anytime on my e email, info at jakecousine.com. And as a final plug, if you're interested in MD, PhD and you're applying this next cycle, I'm actually offering a free prep course from January to February 2023. Um, you know, my time is limited, so spots are limited, but I've got about four spots remaining. So reach me if you want to get in on that. And uh, I just want to close by saying thank you, Arkita, for the opportunity to be here today and share my story. Um, it's opportunities like this that really make a difference in a lot of students' lives. So thank you. I thank you so much for coming and sharing your words of wisdom. We'll definitely put the links to the Instagram and Twitter and email account for those who want to have a course or learn more about becoming a physician scientist. And I'm sure if you have more things to share with us in the future, you're always welcome. So hopefully thank we'll you. have Jake back. I hope so. And for all of the listeners out there, click that subscribe button. If you have any questions, you know, you can reach out to me or med school coach. You can um, contact me on my Instagram at Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R, the letter D, Graham, in order to request any other guests that you think would be great or ask if you want to be on the show because it's all for you. Thank you. And we'll see you again next week. Bye.